Welcome, everyone. Welcome, welcome. Uh, the name of the show is Achieving Great Health. My name is Bob McCauley, owner of the Watershed Wellness Center in Lansing, Michigan. Watershed.net is the website. Blog.watershed.net is the blog. Watershed 11 is a YouTube channel. I do appreciate you joining us. This is a show that discusses natural health and how you can be healthier than you ever imagined. Guest today, my special guest, is Dr. Gerald Pollack from the University of Washington. He is an expert in water. I'm going to let you give all his, uh, he, he'll give you his credentials. Uh, he's got a brand new book out, and we're going to talk about that today. I just wanted to uh, welcome you to the show. Uh, Dr. Pollack, thank you so much for joining us today. Well, thanks so much, Bob. It's a, it's a great pleasure to uh, to be on with you and to chat with your listeners. Uh, did you want me to uh, describe my background or? Uh, yeah, if you could do real yeah, briefly, that, where, where, what? Absolutely, if you could do that, it'd be great. Starting from birth. <laughs> well, we just give the academic credentials. <laughs> Okay, well, I'm a professor at the uh, University of Washington, which is here in Seattle. And uh, I'm also, since I've been deeply involved with water, I actually do a couple of other activities that are related. One of them is uh, editing. I'm the editor-in-chief of a journal called Water. Mm -hmm. (laughs) What else? Mm -hmm. It deals with uh, the science of uh, water, mostly experimental science. And also, uh, I organize each year a series of uh, meetings on water. Usually, it's been uh, annually in Vermont in October. Nice time to be there. Mm -hmm. This year, it'll be in Bulgaria, near Sofia. Bulgaria is noted for its healing waters, and Uh so it's actually a good place to be. And uh, about 100 or so scientists and other people generally interested in water come to that meeting each year. And we have uh, some prominent scientists, some younger scientists, uh, people diversely interested in water. And the meetings are lively, interesting. Uh, This year we have a Nobel laureate, Luc Montagnier, who's going to be there and tell us about his really interesting experiments. So anyway, yeah, I'm basically, I've been at the University of Washington uh, for some time, but these other activities uh, uh, make life extremely interesting. Mm -hmm. Fantastic. So, uh, and uh, also, uh, you just wrote a new book, and uh, I'm very, very interested to take a look at it. I haven't seen it yet, but it's the fourth phase of water, and this is what really caught my attention. And um, you know, I heard you in another interview, and that it kind of popped up on my radar. I'm a big water fan. Uh, my father was in went to MIT, and he has a uh, he's passed away now, but he had a degree in environmental engineering. He taught at Michigan State University, and uh, he ran an engineering company uh, for many years. Um, and uh, he was a well-known water expert, groundwater expert, water purification, water treatment. He did his doctoral thesis on uh, removing radioactive strontium from water back way back in the 50s, early 50s. So uh, it kind of got in, say, water's in the blood, if you will. Anyway, I got into the bottled water business, and... Uh, and discovered something called ionized water or alkalinized alkaline water. It's got a lot of different name, names. It's got something, uh, it's uh, basically water produced by electrolysis. So I began to listen to, uh, you know, read about your book and then look at some of the, uh, or listen to some of the interviews you've done so far. And I just, it really struck a note with me. You've got some similarities here. And definitely uh, almost like a foundation to build on um, what I know. Uh, and I'm, I don't have a scientific background per se, but uh, uh, not, certainly not formal, um, but uh, it sounded like what you're doing could build, you know, or add on to what, what I know about water and, and, uh, and what it is. Um, I guess the first thing I'd like to ask you is, um, uh, you know, a lot of people say, and I'll, I'll think with this is one hit out of the ballpark, water is water. And when I think, Bobby, you and I know water is not necessarily water, that there are many, many, many different types of water. But um, it's kind of a complicated question. Uh, What is water? Do we really know exactly (laughs) what water is? A long preface to a a short but complicated uh, question. Uh, Thanks. Well, this is a problem. Uh, You know, we've all learned from childhood that water is H2O. 
We've also learned, uh, I'll get back to that in a moment, we've also learned that water has three phases. Uh, it has a solid phase, ice, and a liquid phase, and a vapor phase as well. And what we discovered is actually it's not three phases, it's a fourth phase of water that we found. So in this phase is interfacial, that is, it's in between, physically in between, um, between solids and liquids. If you, any water that comes right next to uh, the solids, most solids, not all solids, but um, changes in character and forms this kind of a fourth phase of water. Um, so that that's the the first point. Now, in answer your, to your your question, this water is not H two O. It's actually different. If you if you look at the structure of, of of this water, it's actually a kind of liquid crystalline structure. And if you add up the hydrogens and oxygens, it's not H2O, it's actually H3O2. Okay. And, and, and this actually gives it part of, it, of, of its character. So when someone says, oh, water is H2O, you can't do anything about it, no matter how you treat it, no matter what you do to it, it's just plain old H2O. Well, yeah. it ain't so. Uh -huh. It has this component, this fourth phase in it. And depending on how much of this component is in it, the water can change its character immensely. Mm -hmm. So, so that, that's the point. You mentioned water is in the blood. <clears throat> well, there's plenty of water in blood. And actually, if you look at the water in the blood, a lot of this water is fourth phase water. In fact, water in every cell in your body is mostly this organized, structured fourth phase water. It's mm -hmm. not the kind of water that you find in a glass. So this, this finding, which is described in, in, in the book, in, in great detail, but actually in a way that is accessible for non-experts. That mm. was designed to be that way. It describes the fourth phase and the relevance uh, of the fourth phase for health. Uh, obviously, if your cells are filled with this stuff, it's very important for your health. Mm -hmm. And, and um, uh, also, it, it appears everywhere. Wherever you have an interface of some sort, you have this kind of water. So we're talking about uh, water in the ocean, water in clouds, water all over, uh, mm -hmm. water under the ground, water in contact with minerals. Fourth phase water forms in all of these cases. And if you don't really understand the properties of this kind of water, you can't really understand the uh, properties of the material you're, you're working with. Mm -hmm. There are lots of so-called anomalies of water. And um, there's a famous uh, website, uh, um, uh, uh, that, that exists that describes anomalies of, of water. And what are anomalies? Well, anomalies are what actually doesn't really fit the, the uh, current uh, framework of understanding. Mm -hmm. You can't get the real understanding if you think there are three phases when actually there are four phases. So this fourth phase is actually really important for understanding what goes on in, in water and anything that water touches. Right. Okay. And it's described in the book, and the book, if anybody's interested, you can actually read a few chapters free if you go to the website Ebner and Sons, E-B-N-E-R-A-N-D-S-O-N-S, -E ebnerandsons.com. You can read a few chapters and um, see if, 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 if the work is of interest to you. The, yeah. Thanks. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Um, all right. So, uh, uh, you know, very interesting now. I, again, uh, I mean, there's, there's so, so first of all, I guess we'd say, uh, would you, would you agree with the statement water is the most important element for our health? <laughs> that's a, that's a tricky question. Uh -huh. uh, I'd say yes. Uh, I'd say, you know, everybody knows we're two thirds water, but the water mo molecule is, is so small that in order to make up that two-thirds, since the molecule is so small, it turns out that you need so many of them that 99%, more than 99% of your molecules and my molecules are water molecules. So it's difficult, it's difficult to say that water molecules are unimportant to life when 99% of your molecules are water molecules. Right. Well, the, the, for those of your uh, listeners who, who know about cell biology, and I've studied it, the, the 1,600 or 1,800 page cell biology book talks about every conceivable aspect of cell biology, except water. Uh -huh. water. It's difficult to find water in, in the index. Uh, you know, you find some, some reference to it, but mainly most uh, people studying biology 
think that water is just a background carrier of the more more important molecules of life. What are they? Well, we all know about DNA and RNA and proteins. They're the important molecules. The water is just the background carrier. It doesn't do a hell of a lot. It just sits there. Well, that's simply not true. Yeah. Uh, it's not true for some of the reasons I just, just told you that this fourth phase water is, is really what fills your cells. And the book I wrote 12 years ago, which somehow is making a resurgence it's called Cells, Gels, and the Engines of Life, discusses the role of water in cells. And the basic bottom line is if you can't understand how water interacts with everything else in the cell, there's no way of understanding how the cell operates. It's central to everything that the cell does. So you ask the question, well, is water the most important thing? <laughs> it's hard to say what is the most important thing, but yeah. the water is central for everything we do. Right, right. It's, it's essentially involved uh, in every metabolic process of the body, correct? Absolutely. Yeah. You no, know, if you think, if you think about not only our body, but if you think about plants, <coughs> photosynthesis, the first step in photosynthesis is the water, the the, the plant receives uh, sunlight, and that mm -hmm. light actually splits the water into positive and negative parts. That's the essence of uh, the first step of photosynthesis. Of water, is right at the heart of everything that happens in plants, and the same thing is true of us. Mm -hmm. Now. Let's get into the easy water. Um, it, it, this is water that is ordered or structured. Uh, Correct. Can um, so uh, give give me the differences between uh, the other states of water, in particular, I guess, is the liquid state of regular water, conventional water, we'll call it, and the easy water or this fourth state of water. How does it? Sure, happy to happy to do that. Well. The reason we call it easy, it's sort of easy to remember, mm -hmm. uh, but that's not it, actually. Yeah. It's, uh, it's because we call this exclusion zone. Now, why do we call it exclusion zone, easy? It's because the first thing we found out about it is that it has the kind of structure that excludes almost everything. Uh, and and uh, so if, you, if you're dealing with this kind of water and you try to put solutes or particles or anything you like into it, as it forms, it just excludes, it expels everything that, that's in it. It's kind of like ice, you know. Uh, when ice cubes form, if there are some impurities in the water. Those impurities tend to get rejected, so the ice turns out to be pure crystals, pretty much free of all other stuff. Mm -hmm. This water is pretty much the same. In fact, the structure of this uh, easy water, it's not ice, because ice is solid, but it's not unlike ice either. The, the chemical structure of this is rather similar to ice, but it's missing a, 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 some, well, actually it's missing some protons, and that's basically the difference between this water and ice. So EZ means exclusion zone because it excludes. That's why we give it this name. Another chemist with whom I just had lunch, by the way, uh -huh. um, he likes to call it polyhydroxide because... Uh -huh. um, because, and I think it makes a lot of sense, we couldn't come up with a good name, but he came up with, with that name, polyhydroxide, because the structure actually takes a lot of OH minus groups. Uh, the water can be split into OH minus and H plus. It takes those OH groups, and these groups are actually structured together. Cl they cling together to give you this crystalline-like structure. Mm -hmm. So when you have this structure, you could easily call it poly, meaning many, hydroxide, mm -hmm meaning many hydroxides. Mm. I think the important thing is that the structure of this stuff is a little bit like ice. And there are two more important issues. May I go on? Yeah, absolutely. Yes. Yeah, yeah, because unlike water, which is neutral, this stuff is negatively charged. Mm. Uh, so you have a negatively charged water. And when, so when the water splits, what happens is these OH minus uh, groups cling together somehow, that's described in the book exactly how this happens, forming this, uh, this structure called the exclusion zone. And beyond that are protons, because the water is actually split into these OH minus groups and protons positive. So it's like a battery. Uh, you've got this exclusion zone water, which is negatively charged, and the H2O, which contains a lot of protons with it, uh, that's positively charged. So so this battery-like structure exists. And, um, and the, the other important feature is that, you know, you need energy to build this. You can't 
you can't like charge a battery without energy. This is a battery. You need energy to do it. Right. It took us three years to figure out where the energy came from. And finally, the answer was so simple. It comes from light. It comes uh -huh. from the sun. Uh -huh. You put the sun onto it or you put a lamp onto it. Yeah. And there you go. You build this thing like crazy. Yeah. Especially infrared light. You right. put the infrared light on and this exclusion zone, this, this structured kind of uh, water builds immensely. Yeah. Uh, and when let's be clear, uh, are you really talking about infrared or is it more specifically far infrared? No, it's not really far infrared. It's uh, well, depending on the boundary between near and far. Yeah. So, so the visible spectrum goes from about uh, 0.4 to 0.8 micrometers. Mm -hmm. And starting at one mi two micrometers is fairly powerful. Three micrometers is really powerful. Uh, that's in the infrared, really powerful mm -hmm. for building this stuff. So you can shine a really weak infrared lamp with a wavelength three micrometers, not too far beyond the visible region. And this exclusion zone can, can grow within five minutes by a factor of three easily. Mm -hmm. Now, the beauty of this, go ahead. Well, I'm sorry, go ahead. Well, the beauty of this is that infrared is all around us. You know, yeah. you think of an infrared lamp or a stove or something that's giving off infrared. But actually, if I were to turn off all the lights in my office yeah. and turn on an infrared camera, and pull the shade so it's dark, turn on that camera, I'd get beautiful images of everything, everything around because everything is emitting infrared yeah. energy. It's uh -huh. a, it's, you might call it free energy. Uh, mm -hmm. And it's all over. So, so the buildup of this sort of water battery that that we call it, the buildup of this battery is actually free. It comes from free energy, literally free energy from mm -hmm. from from the environment. I see. Now, uh, um, how does it compare? Have you have you compared it at all to the to, a, for instance, a far infrared sauna? Have you ever seen that? Are you familiar yeah, with that in that wavelength? Yeah, I don't know exactly what what wavelengths are coming out of the sauna. Maybe you know, perhaps you can inform me because I'm not sure. Yeah, well, you're about zero to a thousand uh, uh, microns. So I, I believe it would... Uh, Maybe one to a thousand? Uh, yeah, one to a, one to a thousand. So, oh, and it's, I, it's a broad spectrum. Uh, yeah, yeah. yeah. And, uh, and I think they try to keep it way down on the lower end. But yeah. it, what it's supposed to be doing is mimicking, you know, or reproducing the same... Um, you, you know, infrared rays that we're getting from sunlight, because that's what that's what warms you. Uh, you know, it, like for instance, uh, you step into on a very very cold day, you step into the sunlight and you feel warm. Well, that's far infrared. You know, hitting your body and and feeling that warm. That's why, for instance, maybe a, a cold blooded animal, uh, you know, an insect or uh, a, rep a reptile would cl crawl out in the sun on a very cold day to warm itself, so that the far infrared actually hits it. Um, is, so we're talking something very close, if not identical to that, right? I think we are, yeah. Uh, you're right. You know, you go out into the sun, and most of us feel pretty good when we walk, especially in Seattle, where in the wintertime it's pretty gloomy. <laughs> yeah, right. Same and then we walk out in the sun, and then you see a bunch of smiles if there's sun outside, you have a sunny day. and Yeah. So you tend to feel good, and most of us think, well, you feel good because there's some psychological uh, effect. But in fact... The sun's rays contain uh, contain wavelengths up to about well, I think the uh, I, I don't remember the far end, but certainly up to ten or fifteen or so uh, micrometers, where the tail uh, uh, where where the energy tends to fall fall off, and these are the wavelengths that water absorbs the most. So mm -hmm. any water absorbs three microns very, very strongly and, and other wavelengths near that pretty strongly. And those are the very wavelengths that we find that build easy water. So when you walk out into the sun, what I think what really happens, the reason you feel good is that this energy uh, soaks into your body, mm -hmm. uh, light energy, infrared energy, and uh, it builds the exclusion zones, builds the water structure. And this water structure is absolutely essential for all function. So. Yeah. By building up this water to it, its natural levels where you may feel slightly logy or tired or your muscles ache, and you go into the sun and you suddenly feel good. And I think the reason is that it's building up these, the, this exclusion zone water up back to its natural, natural level. Now, when you go into the sauna, it's really the same thing. This is generating infrared. Infrared mm -hmm. penetrates your body, builds up this kind of interfacial, easy water, 
Mm -hmm. And everybody feels better after they've been in there. You, you know, you don't particularly like the sweat and such, but you come out and you feel like a new person. Right. I think the reason is exactly that. It's a real effect. It's a physical effect. Mm -hmm. It's not a... There may be some psychological aspects, sure, right. to it. But it, it's the actually the energy that you're absorbing in your cells. Mm -hmm. you know, light can penetrate pretty deeply. If, for example, if you... If you darken the room, you shine a flashlight through the palm of, uh, of, of your mm -hmm. hand, you can, if you're dark adapted, you can mm -hmm. see it coming through the other side. So sure. some wavelengths penetrate pretty deeply. Mm. Even some infrared wavelengths uh, mm. can penetrate deeply. And so this deep penetration is, is really what builds up this, this, um, this, this water and makes you feel good because it restores what you, the water that you need for proper function. Yeah, there's a there's a term um, in far infrared when you get into these saunas, and it's called resonant absorption. And uh, I, there's I, there's a lot of misunderstanding about it, but um, you know what it is is really this resonant absorption. So when your cells, your body cells, begin to vibrate at the same frequency as the far infrared uh, wave that's hitting them. Uh, then it then it begins to ab absorb water uh, very efficiently and nice. absorb it. Yeah, sorry. light. I'm sorry, light yeah. very efficiently, and yeah. then it releases since it's now moving, and it begins to release toxins or, or we say, things that don't belong in the body. So, this is the fact. So, but this is what you're looking for. This this term, what we call resonant absorption. Yeah, so, yeah, and I think yeah, it's absolutely it very. It's very important. Um, yeah, yeah. We absorb the energy, build up these exclusion zone, and these mm -hmm. toxins are excluded, so they yeah. come out. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, that explains it really perfectly. Yeah. Now, you mentioned, uh, going back a little bit, you mentioned that the water having a negative charge. Um, could you qualify that just a little bit? Are we talking about uh, a uh, an ionic charge, a negative charge, or are we talking about ORP, uh, a negative charge oxidation reduction potential, uh, measured in millivoltage? What, what's, what is Good the question. charge? Good question. Um, we're talking about real charge. So it goes back to the basics. Um, if you stick an electrode into any one of your cells, uh, you, you measure a negative electrical potential. Typically, it's about a tenth of a volt, 100 millivolts or so. Mm -hmm. There's a classical explanation for this. It's a complicated one. It has to do with membranes and pumps and channels and such. However, when we found that this water, this easy water, had negative charge, things became clear because... You know, this cell is filled with water. It's filled with this negatively charged EZ water. So mm -hmm. it doesn't take a rocket scientist to figure out that, you know, if your cell is packed with water and this water has negative charge, that, well, sure, mm -hmm. the cell is going to have negative charge. So I think this is the reason, uh, the main reason why cells are negatively charged. It also explains why if you stick the same electrode into a gel, and the inside of a cell is just like a gel, but the gel has no membrane around it. You still mm -hmm. measure the same thing. You measure a negative a tenth of a volt or so. And um, it's really hard to argue if, if you have a cell, gel-like cell, with a membrane, and you have mm -hmm. a gel without a membrane, it's hard to argue that the membrane is responsible for the negative charge in the cell. Yeah. So, so there's a real negative charge we're talking about. And I think it, it's very important to maintain that negative charge. So... If you maintain the water, it's almost the same as maintaining the negative charge. You're just building up the negatively charged water, and therefore you're building the negative charge. So, right, right. So we got a lot of real negative charge inside our body. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's occurred to me in the past couple of months or so that, you know, maintaining negative charge really, uh, really kind of makes sense. We think of ourselves as neutral, mm -hmm. but you might not be neutral. I hate to use the term negative because you're not a negative guy, but mm -hmm. but I yeah, think I get you. maybe it may be that that you and I have net negative charge because yeah. our cells are negative. And right. Even the extracellular tissues mostly are consist of proteins that are negatively charged proteins, and the water that surrounds them are negatively charged. So basically, most of us we're, we're negatively charged water, and, mm -hmm. and and so when you just do the arithmetic and start adding up, uh, then, you know, you get negative charge. So then you ask yourself, well, gee, you know, what about antioxidants? So what do oxidants do? You know, oxidants um, uh, confer positivity. They take away the negativity. And right. So you don't want that. You want to keep healthy. So antioxidants work just fine because they prevent that. And I think that's mm -hmm. why a simple explanation as to 
why the antioxidants work as they do. Right. Yeah, I mean, 100% agree with you, and we just w always want this negative, uh, negative environment, negative charge, and uh, negative ion environment. And and um, you know, maybe you could explain it a little clearer to me. But I've always said a, a negative ORP um, and a negative uh, ion are kind of like cousins. And uh, like, for instance, you know, it's another thing you, you get kind of gloomy in the in the wintertime. It's because we've got this buildup of positive ions inside buildings, especially here in Mi Michigan. It's freezing cold. We never open the window. So, you, you, you know, and and uh, and of course, all the negative ions that are much lighter than the positive ions have been stripped out of the environment through all the tree, the leaves being gone from the trees and the winds coming through. And so there's there's this kind of dearth of them to begin with. And then we put ourselves in boxes in our houses. We build up positive charges. So uh, it's very unhealthy environment and things that will make you feel better. Or you could buy a negative ion generator or uh, go take a shower. When you've got movement of water, you've got these negative ions. You go near a, a waterfall or the crashing waves in the ocean or just take a shower you've got negative ions and that seems to you know lighten us up and make us feel better and uh, once again I think you've got exterior negative ions and then and now we're talking as far as water and and what's in, going inside the inside the cell is negative uh, is negative as well so we want to bathe ourselves in this negative iron environment it's, am I said wow. that right brilliantly said <laughs> Absolutely. You're, well, you're, you're right on and you know <coughs> I've been aware of, of, of the issue of negativity and positivity. You know, I, I come from a different background. My original background is actually engineering and electrical engineering, so charges and such come, mm -hmm. come naturally. But mm -hmm. I've kind of come full circle in realizing how important these charges are in virtually everything around us. We did some experiments to check that. You know, I, mm -hmm. I mentioned to you that maintaining this water, maintaining the negative charge inside, inside your cells is really, really critical. And if you have ion positive ions outside that's actually going to detract from that mm -hmm. so we did some experiments where we actually uh, generated uh, and we had a, a setup where we could look at these exclusion zones uh, experimental setup and we exposed it to positive ions and sure enough the exclusion zone diminished in size when we mm -hmm. did that so mm -hmm. so i think the effect is uh, that we're talking about the effect of the positive ions the negative effect of the positive ions mm -hmm. It actually does stem, stem from the fact that it actually impairs the exclusion zones. The, negative, you, the exclusion zones are negative, you add mm -hmm. positivity to it, and you erode mm -hmm. these, uh, exclusion, this exclusion zone water, and you need it. You absolutely need it, need it for all function. So I think it, uh, the effect that you're talking about it really boils down to an effect on the water inside your cells. Mm -hmm. This stuff has a direct effect being in a closed room with lots of people talking and breathing out protons uh, mm -hmm. uh, and, and such, it has a, a direct impairing effect on the exclusion zone water inside your cells. And I think that's probably the main reason why you don't feel good. Right. And, and when you say breathing out neg uh, positive ions, really, carbon dioxide's one example of that. And, of course, that's what we're breathing out. And this is, yeah. uh, you know... Um, the CO2 in water, like carbonic acid, is full of protons. Yeah. We actually we actually get rid of this positive. We have natural ways of getting getting rid of it. You know, the urine uh -huh. also has low pH, and so it's yeah. full of protons. So we pee out right. the, uh, those protons. We breathe out those protons. And mm -hmm. if you sweat, yeah. sweat has low pH, and you get rid of those protons. So I think the body is designed in such a way that it wants to preserve that negativity, and by in in, in so doing, it gets rid of it, actively gets rid of that positive charge. It's not right. good for you. Right. Well, and uh, it's been my main argument um, uh, about drinking uh, against drinking pop or soft drinks because it's full of carbonic acid. Um, it's just an extremely low pH, and of course, it's made with purified water, so it doesn't take much to get that pH very low, and you get the yeah. pH down there below three, uh, honestly. But you're, you're putting all these positive ions in your body. Now, um, uh, one other thing I'd like to say is that I, it sounds to me um, like everything you're describing, of course, is what is found, in, you know, not is found in nature um, everywhere we go, and it's what is. Uh, <clears throat> What is found in really in raw fruits and vegetables, which is a negative charge, 
Um, and, uh, um, you know, for instance, and when I say raw foods and vegetables, I mean very fresh, and especially when you juice them, you're able to measure a, a slight negative ORP. And then I would assume uh, you see a higher pH, uh, and I would assume because you see an abundance of electrons. So, uh, which are all, you know, negatively, negatively charged. Uh, and once again, these are free radical scavengers. We've got free, radical scav free radicals that are missing an electron uh, that are looking to grab onto an electron somewhere in the body. It, may, it ends up grabbing on maybe to a, a, some kind of a molecule or cell and damages it, damages perhaps the DNA. It's one of the causes of disease. It's one of, as we said, we're taking antioxidants. We want to get things that oxidize the body out of the, out of the body. Uh, it's one of the reasons I promote eating as much raw fruits and vegetables as possible because they're negatively charged. Because when you cook a food, uh, you're taking a ne negatively charged substance and you're turning it into a positive charge substance. You're getting rid of all the electrons. Uh, you're really going to acidify it uh, be because of that. It's going to go into the acid range. And of course, now you're consuming that cooked food. Uh, and all these po positive, uh, po the positive charge, and you're accelerating the aging process. Does, how does that work into all this? Uh, it makes make total sense. sense. Yeah. It makes total sense to me. Um, you know, I heard, uh, I went to a conference recently, and I heard some of the uh, practitioner, medical practitioners talking about juicing. I'd heard juicing before, but never quite made sense to me. And suddenly it struck. You know, mm -hmm. what are you doing when you're juicing? And we started juicing after this. Well, you know, you're taking cells, plant cells, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And uh, what you're doing is you're getting rid of the, the tough stuff that's difficult to digest and extracting mm -hmm. the, the cells. Mm -hmm. And these cells are full of easy water, negatively charged easy water, and mm -hmm. you're basically eating it right from the plant. So you're, you're eating something practically living. Makes mm -hmm. total sense. So you're getting all of that easy water from those plants, this negatively charged stuff, to contribute to the negativity of your body and, mm -hmm. and, and helping to replace any of this easy water that's not up to par, or building it up even beyond that for perfect function. Yeah. So sure, that's going to be uh, good for your health. It makes total sense. Cooking it, absolutely, you destroy all of that. Yeah. So, so yeah. take... Take the raw food and just eat it. There you go. It. Makes <laughs> makes a lot of sense. To me. <laughs> uh, I couldn't I couldn't I couldn't agree with you more. Absolutely. Seems like we're in resonance and a lot yeah. of a lot of ideas. Abs absolutely. Yeah. And uh, because again, once again, it's all about this negative charge. I I I actually say tell people all the time, and I'm I don't know if anybody else has says it, but I say the most imp important term you can ever learn about health is the term ORP, oxidation reduction potential, yeah. because everything you put into your body either reduces oxidation or in reduces the aging process, slows it down, or accelerates the the aging process if it's in the po positive. And so, and people of course never heard of this. They don't know what a millivolt is, and they never heard of uh, you know of, of ORP or oxidation reduction. But it's it's once I I began to study ionized water and again I don't have a science background my, my degrees in journalism so I can write but that you know my father was a great chemist he really was but uh, and he would have understood this very very well but you once got it I, by osmosis yeah I, I think so <laughs> right I, I, I picked up yeah. on it and so yeah I could just see that uh, you know I mean it's it, it just all makes sense that you know and, and so I've always said now we go back to the ionized water uh, which is produced by uh, uh, by electrolysis. It's got a lot of different names, but uh, I, I kind of coined the term ionized water because you're technically ionizing the minerals in the water, but you're, you're running the water over positive, negative electrodes, and then you're separating the water so uh, through a membrane. So all the positive charged uh, ions go to one side and all the negatives goes to the other. So you're always producing the two waters at once, one very acid, one very alkaline. Well, we drink the alkaline one, uh, you know, in two Intuitively, or, or let's just say people think, you know, of course, we need the positive, you know, because we should be positive. But ironically, it's the negative we need. But uh, what you what you're doing with it to ionize means to gain or lose an electron. So you're shifting the electrons um, and concentrating them really over and, and to one side. And so in a sense, you're 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 really um, 
you're kind of concentrating what you find in nature. And again, you'll find that in raw fruits and vegetables. But here, I mean, if you fill up a glass ionized water, you'll see it's fully oxygenated. It's full of bubbles. I mean, really tiny little bubbles. It's very cloudy. And that cloud will disappear within just, a, you know, within 30 seconds. That disappears. Uh, and that's when you get the you immediately get this low negative charge. And then, of course, since it's so unstable and you're dealing with electrons, it, it disappears quite quickly, although that negative charge will, will stay in there, again, depending on the conditions, the container, the temperature of the water, and certain other factors. It'll stay there for up to 24 hours with the negative charge, you know, slowly working its way back up. But uh, I said, you know, to me, what I saw when I saw ionized water, and when I first, you know, and again, uh, I got into this, you know, way back in 96, nobody that I knew knew how to explain it well at all. And uh, they were just sort of selling the product and they knew it was good for you and it felt beneficial. But anyway, the light came on um, oh, one day over my head. I said, ORP, oxidation, that, that's why it's so special. That's why this is so incredible and that's what's going on. So, um, but this, again, what I always say is it's mimicking what we found in, find in nature. And of course, it's, it's quite enhanced. It's quite, quite strong. So I think it'd be interesting to find... Uh, uh, you know, a, a direct, you know, a, a do a study or, or begin to study this, a direct, more direct correlation between what you're studying, which is easy water, which when I f first heard one of your interviews and, and read what was going on in your book, that I said, this this is ionized water. This is what I've always said. This is a negative charge water. And here we are reproducing it here in a very strong way. And, and then, of course, I say consume it. And, you know, certain times, of course, you don't drink it around mealtime and this sort of thing because it, it, it upsets digestion. But uh, this is what we should be consuming because we're consuming it's it's identical to raw fruits and vegetables in every way it has a negative charge abundance of electrons it's alkaline and it even is a very because it's structured and i can go into that in one second uh it's very detoxifying a little bit different but other than that it's identical to raw fruits and vegetables in particular juice other than there's no nutrients in it so it's just water and uh and then i would like to talk about this structure of the structured water because once again you know we've always uh you know you know by the way the russians have done a lot of work on this and i think the japanese have studied it there are some phd there is one phd level book that's written about ionized water so it's not just uh, a lot of people kind of dismiss it completely but uh it's been studied and studied and it's published by elsevier uh, publishers and and um and uh you know again very high level phd book um, but uh, it talks about the structures of water too, and maybe a six-sided water molecule cluster. Um, how, how the the structure of easy water? How does that? Uh, uh, it's a six-sided. <laughs> it's exactly the same. Huh. Uh, it's wow. six-sided. We. Uh, it's a honeycomb. It's actually, as I said, it's it's built up of OH groups, but they're arranged in a way that's a little bit like ice. It's like a, a series of sheets stacked on one another and each sheet is a honeycomb full of hexagons mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and so it's pretty much the same as as you're talking about um you know we we um i just want to first say that a colleague of mine in japan has been studying this stuff intensely his name is sanataka shirohata mm -hmm. and he's published many papers on uh, electrolyzed ionized whatever whatever you call it yeah. uh, water with many uh, positive aspects uh, shown and he was telling me I don't know this firsthand, but he was telling me that there were clinical studies done in, in Japan. Uh, some people were highly skeptical, and as a result of the skepticism, clinical studies were undertaken, and the results seemed to be so impressive that right now he told me that anybody in Japan who has any kind of gastrointestinal problem checks into a hospital, the first thing they do is give them ionized water, yeah. and the insurance yeah. pays for it. And So mm -hmm. apparently the Japanese are convinced uh, that there's something going on there. Well, we produced this about five or six years ago in our experiment before I even knew there was such a thing as ionized water that you could you could produce. A Russian colleague of mine came to uh, Seattle into our laboratory and we started mm -hmm. doing some experiments, putting two platinum wires inside of water and putting like 10 volts or so on them. And we found that uh, some kind of negatively charged water accumulated right near the negative electrode mm -hmm. and positively charged water near the positive electrode. Mm -hmm. And these retained their charge. We found we could pull out those electrodes and then check the blob of negatively charged water and the blob of positively charged water next to it. And they indeed had negative charge and positive charge. 
and the odd thing was that, you know, ordinarily you put a negative charge next to a positive charge, and all they want to do is combine, you know, like mm -hmm. man and woman. Uh, yeah. And they don't do that. Uh, they remain separated. And this was the puzzle. We found <clears> that those blobs remain separated, and we published this in a couple of papers in some scientific journals, showing that they remain separated, yet they retained opposite opposite charge. And we came to the conclusion that the only way they could do this, if these charges were actually embedded in some matrix, like, like two sponges next to each other, one's mm -hmm. positive, one's negative, and they couldn't, couldn't combine with each other. And we checked that and we found that in, in the negatively charged water there was indeed some, some kind of structure. We, mm -hmm. could, we could check that. So, so I think a, a possibility is, is that the, this electrolyzed negatively charged water is possibly, maybe, the same as easy water. Mm -hmm. We checked our measure of easy water in a couple of the machines that we have, and we couldn't confirm it, but those studies are still going on. So we're not sure, but there's definitely a negative charge, and your cells definitely like the negative charge. So it makes total sense to me and agrees yeah. with the Japanese studies that there's something going on there that looks like it ought to be beneficial. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, it's a it's a medical device in in uh, Japan and in uh, Korea, and oh, official yeah, both those places yeah. official medical device. Uh, it's been applied. Uh, they've applied for it in Taiwan and probably going to get it, and then the same in China. So all those countries are. In fact, China I think has accepted it as a medical device, and they're now, they're now certifying that. Um, you know, if you produce these water ionizers, and of course the magic of a water ionizer is that you know you're actually you were saying that it, it's um, it's uh, easy to uh, or you the the two different negatively and positive charge ions didn't mix. They, right. they thought they would have. Well, yeah. um, I always found that curious, too. I said, why don't they just mix together? But uh, with a water ionizer, you have a membrane um, in most uh, most of the units. And so as you produce it, it's even easier, even easier to separate them. Sure, it may be easier, but it's actually not necessary. <laughs> yeah. yeah, well, easier. now that's the thing. So uh, now there's a guy in Taiwan, and it's actually where we buy our water ionizers, and he's probably done more sh research with water ionization and been more successful than anybody I know. One thing he did was um, water ionizers have electrolytic cells uh, so that you apply the positive and negative charges to, and then it has various size plates, three, five, seven plates usually, um, and uh, they're, they're rectangular. So what he did... Uh, you know, so he's, you know, Chinese background, Asian minded. And he says, well, first of all, this is wrong. We don't want, we don't want a box. We want, we want a circle. You know, this is, this is how nature flows. Mm. So it's the first thing he said. So he developed two round plates. So now he's got, uh, I'm going to say, um, uh, you know, he's got about an eight inch, uh, uh, set, I say he's lower, smaller now. I'm going to say he's got about a, a five inch uh, round plate and he's got two of them and you don't need any membrane with this. It's the only one that's ever been invented. And the, and, and he's creating it just through a, a, a positive negative charge. It's only the, the plates are only coated on one side. You usually use titanium plates co coated with platinum uh, for the conductivity. But this, and then you coat both sides. So, uh, and then of course you need to get the same results. You need about five five plates that are going to be considerably larger than this one five inch uh, round plate that only has two plates. It's only coated, coated on one side. When I say coated, I mean it's titanium and then it's coated with platinum. So, so it's a tremendous reduction in cost production. But, and, but um, the other thing you don't get with it is any kind of scaling that, the, that you don't get that deposit of scale. That's one of the biggest problems with a water ionizer. Uh, is that, you know, there's all these schemes that have been tried to develop by different manufacturers to get rid of the scaling on the plate so that, you know, the water stays, you know, strong and, you know, you don't get, uh, you know, the water's coming in contact with the actual electrode and not with the minerals that's that's been deposited on, on the electrode. So at any rate, uh, but that, that made a huge difference in, again, making this round plate. And, yeah, you don't need a membrane. And he produced, you know, this water is just produced instantly. I mean, it's, yeah. you know, it's, it comes right out of the tap immediately. So it's right, really quite extraordinary. And, I, you know, I've said, uh, when I first discovered this, I said, uh, my gosh, this is one of the most, uh, I mean, this is one of the most incredible things I've ever seen. Uh, you know, I'm, so I'm in my 50s. So that would rate up with me was uh, the walk on the moon. 
the 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 uh, invention of the personal computer, uh, you know, and all all everything that's come from then, and ionized water. <laughs> Just witnessing that, I said, this is this has got to be one of the most incredible things I've ever seen. Join us next time on Achieving Great Health for part two of my interview with Dr. Gerald Pollack and see if easy water really is ionized water. This is part two of my interview with Dr. Gerald Pollack on the subject of easy water and how it relates to ionized water. Is it the same? Here is part two. When you create ionized water, you're taking normal tap water, filtering it, and, and then running over positive negative electrodes and creating positive negative ions in the water. And you're transforming it instantly, and what you're doing is you're transforming it instantly into a very powerful antioxidant. And you know, you can adjust the pH, it's got different levels of power you can apply to it, so you can go from a, a pH. Uh, which really is all controlled by the electrons in the water because in pH is that measurement of positive negative ions in, in the water. So uh, you're able to adjust it, but you're able to get a pH between 9.5 and, and 10, well, ideally, where you get this really low negative charge anywhere from maybe 200 or 250 to maybe, you know, 300, 350. And you'll see, that's a, you know, again, a very low negative charge. And uh, you look at a raw fruit and vegetable, you'll see the same thing. You, you know, if you juice that very quick, or, or, juice it and then measure that ORP very quickly, there's things in the liquid that will tend to interfere with the measurement, meaning that water is a little easier to measure because there's no buffers in there, but you'll see that has that, that negative charge. So again, my, 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 I guess my premise and my I always postulated that ionized water is found in nature because everyone says it isn't. Uh, it's found in nature and it's very, it's exactly like nature. And then again, that's what makes it so, so special and so unique. And the fact that it's structured, of course. Well, I, I, I think you're onto something when it resembles nature. You know, if you look at the water that comes from deep springs, for example, mm -hmm. uh, you know, it has minerals in it and it's also under pressure. Mm -hmm. But we found that uh, pressure, if you take ordinary uh, water with minerals in it, mm -hmm. even without minerals, it, it, and you put pressure on, the pressure actually shifts the equilibrium from the ordinary bulk water to this uh, easy water. Mm -hmm. And the reason it does that is easy water is denser than regular. So if you take something and put pressure on it, it likes to convert to the denser kind mm -hmm. of, uh, of constituent. We found experimentally that that's true. So if you look at the water that comes from deep sources, which mm -hmm. is under pressure and has minerals, it's going to contain a lot of uh, easy water. And people who have made measurements, for example, of some of the waters, the healing waters that come from the famous places like mm -hmm. uh, Lourdes and such, mm -hmm. uh, I've seen some of the measurements done by some labs, and they actually show uh, that they contain easy water. Mm -hmm. so, so when you say mimicking nature, I think it may mimic some of the best waters that we actually have in, in, in nature, the ones that are known to be good for healing. Yeah. The same is true, actually, of glacial melt. Right. You know, some of the, like the Hunza and people mm -hmm. who, who take this uh, water in high, high mountains that comes directly from glaciers. If you look at this water, now I've looked a few places in the world. I've done a bit of traveling. And when the water melts from a glacier, it's kind of greenish. I don't know if you've ever noticed that. Uh, just beyond the melt portion, you, mm -hmm. you have these rapidly running streams. And if you look into them, they kind of glow a kind of greenish or a turquoise. Oh. And as they run uh, uh, for some distance, they eventually turn dark and black and uh, what have you. And the reason for that, I think, is that these waters contain easy water, and easy mm -hmm. water fluoresces in, in that color. So when no. you have that water, you have the sun shining on it, and the light that's given off by this water should be in this kind of turquoise, uh, uh, this turquoise color. And the reason, actually, the reason that you get easy water from ice melt mm -hmm. is that the ice is just like easy water. As I said, there's a very small difference between the two, and in fact, we showed in, in the book that I mentioned to you and in some papers that if you melt ice, the first thing you get is not water. You get easy water. So you mm -hmm. go from ice to easy water mm -hmm. to bulk water. And if you, in fact, if you freeze water, same thing happens. You go from water to easy water and then to ice. It's a necessary step in between the two. But in terms of health and drinking, so if you, if you take the glacial melt, it's got it's got a lot of this easy water. Now, I don't know if people have tried to see how good this is for your health, but I think this is probably another of nature's ways 
perhaps of providing really good water for health. So whether mm -hmm. it's the deep spring water, the glacial melt, or the ionized water that mm -hmm. they're talking of, actually several other people have been manufacturing different kinds of waters that they claim have enormous health benefits. Mm -hmm. Some people actually claiming that they can reverse pathologies. Mm -hmm. This needs mm -hmm. to be studied. I think there's, there hasn't been one central group that has studied comparatively all of these different waters that are touted uh, to be uh, good for your health. And I know that the ionized water has many studies. Mm -hmm. The other people have fewer studies, and I yeah. think it would be worthwhile for somebody to actually, we'd like to do that, in fact, if we could get the funds to do it. NIH is not often as forthcoming for those kinds of studies. That mm -hmm. uh, We'd like to do that, to take uh, ionized water at different pHs, to take some of the other waters that mm -hmm. have been produced by other people that claim huge health benefits, yeah. perhaps yeah. some of the spring water, and test comparatively how, how they deal with, with various health issues. Yeah, I mean, very important to do. I think. Yeah, ab absolutely. And you're yeah. you're correct in saying that. Uh, you know, th there's I uh, in my book in the back. I talk, I have I do have that bibliography, and I do mention that book I uh, uh, produced by Elsevier. But yeah. uh, I have over I think now probably forty or fifty studies, and there's many, many more. I mean, it was that was thing. It was my third edition published uh, over a year ago. So there's many more people are looking at this. Uh, of course, there's. A tremendous amount in in, uh, in that of work that was done with this in Russia. I with the you know this goes back as far as uh, I can find 1904, but they studied it in the 30s and then um, I, I you know there's actually uh, uh, and they studied it in the late 60s and in, um, in 69 and I put it in in my book right in the beginning about where they did that in Russia, but they were trying to remove interestingly radiation from the body. Mm -hmm. uh, they had tremendous radiation problems in uh, in Russia, um, and um, and they they were trying to use some foods for that, and there there are some successful ones, but one of them was ionized water, and uh, I I I you know I don't know why, but uh, I mean I I just imagine I'm just guessing that it must have just something to do with the you know the charge in the water and the negative charge and what really radioactive radioactivity is when it ends the body and how this somehow either negates it or manages to push it out. I think uh, it manages to push it out because um, if you <coughs> if you drink the, the, the right uh, kind of uh, waters it, it, that that build easy water, the mm -hmm. easy water excludes everything, radioactive, yeah. non-radioactive, it doesn't matter. Uh, yeah. We found everything. We could, we could test substances as low as molecular weight, about 100 or so, mm -hmm. and they're all pretty much excluded and below 100 is difficult to test but I think a, a good possibility is that that's the mechanism behind that success that the Russians had doing that mm -hmm. Just, you build up the, it's like building up ice but you're building up water that excludes yeah. various substances so it's natural it goes out yeah yeah uh, and I don't think uh, it was such a new thing I don't think uh, they really under they really understood what was going on at the time because it it, it didn't continue but they continued to use it and yeah. and there there was always these um, there was these stories about when they did do this that back in the 30s that the the people that were involved with it and ended up drinking this water you know lived very healthy and and there were stories about it but there were more anecdotal I, and and of course the other thing is this is all in Russian so you know I mean it's just like the Japanese have done a lot of studying on ionized water but it's all in Japanese and so who's going to spend the money to translate it you don't need yeah. the money now you can Google will translate yeah right yeah. so it's really easy I just read some Russian stuff this morning that. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. was translated. The Russians have done enormous amounts of uh, work on water. I'm going to Russia next week oh. to participate in, in a couple of meetings, and it's always a delight to go there because the Russian scientists are mostly really open-minded and uh, have done amazing experiments with water, many of which we don't, really don't, don't know about. Yeah, yeah. We should know about it because there's right. a, a wealth of information there. Yeah, they really are. That's what they do. There's no entrepreneurial uh, history over there. I mean, that's what the, so the Japanese kind of <laughs> took the idea, and they they are the ones that really uh, 
you know, uh, commercialized ionizers. There's a do doctor, actually, I think back in the in the mid '80s that f produced the first ones, and then uh, it became very popular by the '90s, and it been very common in Japan uh, to a certain degree. And then the the, the Koreans picked it up, and later, uh, you know, the Chinese, really, the Taiwanese picked it up, and that's been about it. There's nobody else really making these, but uh, but the Russians had done all the water, uh, all the work on it, and I corresponded. Uh, with somebody at one of the universities, I can't think of the name off the top of my head, but uh, I, I asked them for studies and if they had anything and if they had anything in English. This is when I first wrote my book, and I got I got a response, and they had some papers that I that they ended up sending me some, and uh, but yeah, they've done by far the most amount of studying that that I've seen on water and uh you know they're very good at all that stuff the russians i mean they really have done tremendous work i mean i think the first work with negative ions back in the you know the 19th century i believe it was around 1850s or so was done in russia that the discovery of negative ions and what the role they played and how they uh you know um you know how how they had the effects on the body and i mean there's there's a, there's a lot of anecdotal stuff um coming back as far as the Greeks talking about how weather changes affected people and they were norm they would notice that you know what they were describing was the neg the a lot of winds coming down stripping out which is essentially the negative ions out of the air really caused a lot of trouble people would get depressed uh, they wouldn't feel as well there was a lot more sickness and then certain to other times uh, you know they felt like there was this buildup of what they called electricity and and you know and in uh, in the atmosphere and they felt better so there's anecdotal evidence going back but like I said the Russians were the first ones to uh, to really study that um, uh, it, the charge effects are uh, incredibly important. You know, um, you you ask yourself, maybe you haven't asked yourself, but you look up and you see a cloud in the sky and you ask yourself, why is that cloud actually sitting up in, in the sky? You know, if you measure the cloud is full of droplets, water mm -hmm. droplets, ask yourself, well, gee, you know, if you add up all those water droplets, it's pretty heavy. Someone calculated that in a cumulonimbus cloud, you know, those giant clouds that mm -hmm. are responsible for the thunder showers and such, mm -hmm. the weight uh, of a cloud, if you add up all those water droplets, it turns out it's uh, something like 15 million elephants. <laughs> <laughs> Instead of kilograms, elephants is a sort of a more tangible kind right, of yeah. number. So you ask the question, well, gee, you know, if there are 15 million elephants sitting in that cloud, how come those elephants don't come down on your head or my head? Right. What keeps them up? And I think you were mentioning charge and charge in the atmosphere, and I think charge is really uh, 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 probably the reason, because the, the, the Russians and others found out that the Earth is negatively charged. I'm not sure if, if, if you were listeners are aware of that, but it's well established that the surface of the Earth is negative. And so mm, right. if you have something in the atmosphere that's also negative, like water in the clouds, mm -hmm, uh, mm -hmm. the two will repel each other, and there it's easy to keep those elephants up in, in the clouds. And right. I think that's the reason. And so uh, what happens is that when it rains, is a time when the positive charge in the air begins to neutralize that, that negativity, and so the cloud comes down, down, down. Mm -hmm. And as it comes down, then finally it, it, it tends to rain. We don't get rain from high clouds. We get rain from low clouds. Mm -hmm. Anyway, the point is that what you were making, that charge in the, in the atmosphere, it's it's not only important for how you feel, mm -hmm. uh, you depressed or happy, or whatever, but it's also important for atmospheric conditions. And I think that mm -hmm. hasn't been taken into account. Most people thinking about weather, they think about pressure and temperature. Mm -hmm. I think the most important variable is charge. Yeah. Uh, next book is going to deal with that. <laughs> yeah, fantastic. I mean, yeah. absolutely. And it's funny where I, I was just about to mention the, the negative charge of the Earth before you said it. Oh, you were. And, okay. Yeah, you know, and well. And this, what what has been kind of called late, lately grounding or just running around in your bare feet, um, and because you're getting that negative charge, and 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 that's another thing that can you know I mean your body likes because you become charged. Um, you know we, we've got there's bracelets you wear that actually. Uh, put you uh, put a negative charge into your body they have them around your neck you have them uh, around your hand and they and they're negatively charged they grab the the uh, they actually allow you to conduct electricity through the body rather than uh, you know, if you touch electric, something electrical with both hands, you, you'll basically electrocute yourself. And it's a, uh, it's a microelectrocution, but that's what's happening, whereas one of these bands here will allow ions to travel more freely through the body. It's also what goes on with they've got these uh, 
ionic foot baths. I, I don't uh, deal with them, and I, I've only used one a couple times myself, but they're just putting negative ions uh, into the body. They're just an ionization process, and so you, and you feel a lot better. There's some claims made about them that I, I, don't, I don't go along with, but uh, pulling all sorts of toxins out of the body. And, you know, honestly, it would. Uh, you and I have been talking, as you put negative ions in the body, things that are positively charged that don't belong in the body will tend to start coming out. Uh, it's just they kind of go a little, little bit too far with some of these claims, but um, uh, but it's, it's the same principle. Um, there's one other quick uh, area here that I wanted to cover, and I'll just get your opinion on it. How, uh, and I don't know if you've studied it, but how does uh, easy water uh, differ from purified water, and that means water that has been produced by distilled or reverse osmosis. Have you studied that at all? You, you see? Well, we, we, we haven't studied specifically, but, uh, you know, purified water is, is or pure water, we, we use that in many of our experiments. That's simply H2O. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, and, and, and the easy water is anything but H2O. It's H3O2. It's totally mm -hmm. different. Every one of its physical and chemical properties differ from yeah. H2O. So, right. so when you know when someone someone raises the flag and says, "Well, water can't really do anything because just H2O, no matter what you do to it, it's yeah. just completely wrong." Yeah, it's not, not correct. Right. So, so and we so we really don't find H2O in in nature uh, in the sense that uh, you know, like in the rain clouds, we don't see that. Well, but, there there's some. I, I, I don't want to... I mean, pure, to, pure, to, and what I really mean, purified water, not just... There's water, water, okay, but I mean, is it really pure water, uh, or is it some of it the uh, the the easy water? or Some of it's easy water. The, the droplets, the aerosol droplets that form the clouds, there are droplets that are 5 or 10 micrometers in size. Right. And the evidence that we have, uh, again, also <laughs> described in, in, in the book, shows that these droplets... It's not just water. It's actually a shell that contains EZ water, mm -hmm. uh, that negatively charged, charged shell. Mm -hmm. And inside is, is regular H2O full of protons. And those yep. protons inside, it's like having a, having a ball. And the material of the ball is EZ water. And inside, you have a lot of water with charge. Those charges repel each other. They create pressure. And that's why the droplet is round, because that pressure is being exerted on the membrane. The membrane is of easy water. Right. I think that's what the droplets in the cloud look like. Mm. Also, yeah. in the atmosphere, when you have a when you have a humid atmosphere, you know, like if you live on the east coast mm -hmm. um, during the summertime, and you look at the air, and the humidity feels awful. But also, you can't see very far. The air looks pretty uh, uh, not clear. And the reason mm -hmm. it looks not clear is it's filled with these little aerosol droplets, and these mm -hmm. droplets scatter light. So mm -hmm. if you're looking from point A to point B, you're actually looking through a lot of little droplets, and those droplets scatter the light. That's why everything looks fuzzy when it's when it's humid out. Mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. So anyway, the the cloud contains not just H2O by any means. It's yeah. much different from that. So, right. Uh, you know, and I've always said that, you know, we don't find pure chemical substances in nature um, in their gas or liquid forms that they're always mixing up with something. It's just the nature of everything that, you know, um, that you're going to, it's going to meld and come together. And, Good point. Uh, yeah, and it's... Good point. It, and it's 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 one of the reasons why we don't find purified water out in nature. So many people told me through the years, purif drink purified water, which I think is 100% opposite of really ionized water. When you start to look in it in its real pure form, because you got a gallon of of distilled water and a gallon of ionized water, you'll find they're comp if you can really sit there and measure them, they're totally different from each other. The oh, yeah. charge is different. The the ORP is different. There, it's of course it's void of electrons. Uh, you know everything at the structure of the water is uh, there's a water out called penta water when because it's five-sided and this five-sided shape d is not found in nature and, and is very bad for the body and very harmful and doesn't hydrate the body well at all and leaves actually leaves it dehydrated which is anecdotally what many people have told me through the years that I, I, I start drinking reverse osmosis or purified water and it, I, I start you know having all sorts of I, I went to the doctor I was dehydrated and how could that be? I drink a gallon every day. I, I spend money on this distiller and everything. I said, well, that's why it's not found in nature. So, um, yeah, okay, that uh, that shores up what I what I always uh, has have said about that. Um, you know, and and going back one more time about the structure of the water in this layering. Um, 
uh, and I think I've heard that in one of your other um, uh, one of the other talks or interviews you did on this. Um, the the water molecule clusters and those shapes. You, they, they this easy water it layers. Can you explain that a little bit? Yeah, if you have a surface, um, whether it's a surface of some material or a surface of a molecule or something, mm -hmm. these layers begin to build. So if you have a, let's say you have a particle that's suspended in the water, then uh, this this particle, think of it as a ball, a small ball, and just like onion layers uh, will tend to build up uh, around the periphery of this ball. And those onion layers, layer after layer is, is the easy or easy water that builds. If you have a flat surface, uh, then the layers build their sheets that build. So it doesn't really matter whether it's a flat surface or a curved surface or even an irregular surface. Mm -hmm. These sheets or layers will build up. And we found they can build quite far. Um, the, the, uh, the, the current view of most chemists is that water may actually form a structured, <coughs> structured entity of some sort.